Um, now, but just as a starter for 10 with this, um, how many people recognize that name? Wojciech Krakowski in connection with the McCanns. Anyone? Anyone in the audience know that name? This, I've asked this question to 11 audiences now and one person on my whole tour that's out of about 1,000 people is known. Sorry, there's, there's somebody over there. Was he the Russian spin doctor that put in the whole idea about how to um, use the media in order to basically mind control the public into doing their... The party's ideology. No, he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, Wojciech Krukowski, he's a picture of him. Now, I'm not surprised that you all don't know who Wojciech Krukowski is because he's one of the most important people to know about in order to understand how the Portuguese police were misled. And just think of how many media headlines we've had about Madeleine McCann. Thousands over the last eight years. Probably more headlines than any other subject. And they haven't told you about Wojciech Krakowski. Here he is here. This is a photograph from the Portuguese police files. All right? Now, in order to explain the importance of Wojciech Krakowski, on the night Madeline was reported missing, one of the McCann's friends, Jane Tanner, uh, made a statement to the Portuguese police saying that she saw a man carrying a child away from the apartment. Now, just over two weeks later, there was another person came forward, or another family came forward, the Smith family, and they said that they saw a person carrying a child away from the apartment about 600 yards away, but about 45 minutes later. So that's two sightings of somebody carrying a child away from the apartment on that evening. But there was a third sighting, or a third incident reported to the police shortly after Madeline was reported missing. Somebody called Nuno Lorenco contacts the Portuguese police and says that somebody tried to abduct his little blonde daughter, very similar to Madeline, in a place called Sagres, 16 miles west of Praia de Luz, where the McCanns were staying. So the Portuguese took a detailed statement from him, and he gave a very detailed uh, description of the man who was supposed to have come into a pastry shop and attempted to abduct his child and then fled uh, in a car. Now, Nuno Lorenco uh, gave the Portuguese piece a description of the car, a description of the man, and also a partial number plate. And he managed to get um, a partial photograph of, of, of that vehicle. So the Portuguese police obviously thought, well, this is probably the man that's taken Madeline. So they managed to trace the man who was in that car, and it was Wojciech Krakowski, who was on holiday in the area with his partner. So they um, traced him, and he'd, he'd got on a plane shortly before Madeline's report of missing, and he's back in Poland, where he lives. So they got into Paul to go and connect him, but they completely ruled him out of their investigation. Wasn't involved in Madeline's disappearance. And it seems uh, now that uh, there's huge question mark over this Nuno Lorenco statement, whether or not this even happened. Because there are no, as far as I'm aware of, there's no independent witnesses to this man attempting to take a child in a pastry shop. Uh, and also, it's very strange that Nuno Lorenco only reported that his daughter was attempted to be abducted six days later, just after Madeline uh, was, was reported missing. And here's the clincher. The description of Wojciech Krakowski is almost identical to the man Jane Tanner described, and is also almost identical to what the Smith family described. It is the hypothesis of this new film that all these sightings may be based on a real person, on a patsy, Wojciech Krakowski. And this was, this was possibly all fabricated in order to mislead the Portuguese police into believing that there had been an abduction. But as I say, it's a three hour long film and I'm not surprised that no one has heard of Wojciech Krakowski. Okay. I'm just going to show you a brief clip from this film because I actually went to try and speak to, or I did speak to one of the McCann's private investigators. Now, the person that mainstream media should have doorstepped, I have come to try and speak to today. That is somebody called... And I'm sitting outside the block of flats where he lives. Worked for the McCann's for six months. And in that six months, he had uh, an insight into the true investigation, quotes, investigation, uh, into allegedly trying to find Madeline. 
this man who worked for the McCanns for six months told me that he forensically examined all of Jane Tanner's statements as we have just done and he thought that none of what she said could have happened. Right, so that's the McCann's own employed private investigator saying that he didn't believe their friend's statements about there being an abduction. Uh, now he told me, I actually sat with him for three hours and uh, one thing he told me was that their job was to examine the McCann's mail uh, and he said that um, he began to get really suspicious when a lot of that mail was unopened. If your daughter's gone missing and you're wanting to look at every lead, are you gonna, are you gonna leave your mail unopened? He told me a lot of other things, um, much of which I haven't made public uh, because I'm not sure how much of it was actually true, what he was telling me. Uh, now, just to recap on the films, the first film is uh, four hours. The second film looks specifically at claims of an abduction, three hour long film. And there may be more coming out because I'm intending this to be the definitive account of the whole McCann affair. Because one film that could potentially be made is all about uh, the timeline from Madeline being reported missing backwards. Okay, because that would shed light on when Madeline may have died. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have tried to get these uh, documentaries on my TV show, Rich Planet TV, but the TV company have refused to air them. Basically, because I haven't got any balls, it's as simple as that. Um, so they've refused to air the Madeline documentaries. I also asked them if they would air the Patsy Driver film that you saw a clip of there. They've refused to air that. They refused to air a film I made about a horse, horse mutilation case called Silent Killers in Sussex. They refused to air so certain comments made by Max Burns about certain ufologists. Uh, they also refused to air an interview that I did with Dr. Nick Collistrom. And all we were doing was discussing MP's letters that had been written to Rich Planet viewers after Rich Planet viewers had given them uh, 40 pages of documents asserting that the London bombings were probably a staged or fabricated terror event. And some of those letters were very, very interesting. I was really annoyed when they refused to air this programme because all we were doing was discussing letters we got from MPs and they wouldn't even air that. And it, it was the culmination of a lot of work because I'd run a campaign from sort of September 2012 to encourage Rich Planet viewers to go to their MPs and to get reply letters. I collected all of these reply letters from MPs and then we'd set up a TV programme and we discussed all the letters and then they wouldn't put it on television. Um, in fact, they've made it clear to me that any programme the challenges um, accepted narratives of any recent story. They were not prepared to air. So I'll give you an example. Here's an email from the TV company. It says, everyone remember the Rosetta spacecraft last year, which supposedly landed on the side of a comet? It says here, we also won't be able to air a show on the Rosetta spacecraft on whether it's fact or fiction. It's too prominent in the news and could upset a few folk. <laughs> So this is what I'm up against with, um, with my, the TV company that I'm providing my TV shows to. And each program that I air, I have to pay them £600, yet they're censoring a lot of my most um, important material. And the excuse they're really using with certain ones, say the Madeline one, the Patsy Driver one, and I would say this one, the London bombings one, they're saying that if, you, if there's an official story where someone has been harmed, murdered or killed or whatever, or is missing, what have you, yeah? Uh, that if you challenge that accepted narrative and you say, well, I don't think it happened that way, I think it happened this way, they say, well, that could cause offence to the relatives, so we're not going to put it out. So they, that's the excuse they're using for challenging accepted um, narratives. So much for freedom of speech. Okay, now last year I did a survey to try and find out Britain's most subversive TV programme, and uh, Rich Planet viewers voted the BBC News the most subversive show on television. And this year, I'm launching a new survey. Now, I'm asking you to take part in another subversion survey to try and find out the most subversive and manipulative false hero or role model. What do you mean by that, Richard? Well, if we look at former KGB agent Yuri Bezmenov's subversion chart, we see that one of the ways of subverting an entire nation is to use what he calls false heroes and role models. These are people who are promoted in the mainstream media to the masses in order to manipulate the masses into following particular ideals, follow particular morals, 
beliefs and live particular lifestyles which are subtly promoted by the fake role model. I could give you a list as long as one's arm of my particular favourite subversive fake heroes, but I want you to do it for me. <coughs> Brian Cox. Now, who would you vote for? Please email me your suggestion and I will compile a league table of the most subversive heroes and role models. Don't forget to state why you think they are fake and why their fake behaviour is subversive. Alright, so here's the results of the 2015 false hero and role model survey. Brian Cox, number one. <laughs> Had nothing to do with me. Right, I'm going to read out some comments. These are Rich Planet viewers' comments. They're not my comments about these fake heroes. Brian Cox. I'm cleverer than you lot, and I'm telling you in a pally way that everything is as the science book says it is. This viewer says, his statement about intelligent life, and that in his opinion there has never been intelligent life in the universe because we would have heard from them, stunned me to the core. Next viewer says, he made dismissive, smug comments about UFO sightings with his usual stupid, effeminate smirk on his face. <laughs> this viewer says, I would like to nominate Brian Cox, because that's what I was told to say by a subliminal message on some TV program I was watching. <laughs> also, he's a complete arse. <laughs> But for me, it's what Brian Cox doesn't talk about that makes him subversive. Yeah? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the most important book written this century? Where Did the Towers Go? by former professor of engineering mechanics, Dr. Judy Wood, which proves that the World Trade Center Towers didn't even hit the ground. They were turned to dust in midair, which could not have been caused by aeroplanes. Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about Flight 175 on 9-11 and the totally impossible physics of Flight 175. Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the technology of cold fusion which was suppressed in 1989 and if it, it hadn't been suppressed it could have gotten the world off fossil fuels. Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about over unity devices such as the Bedini motor? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about anti-gravity research? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the Byfield Brown effect, which some say has been developed into anti-gravity propulsion? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about theoretical physicist Mikhail Alcubierre's mathematical model where space around an object is shifted so that the object would arrive at its destination faster than light would in normal space? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the thousands of pilots that have reported seeing UFOs? And why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the evidence of Professor Emil Schweitzer, Belgium's top radar expert, who examined radar data from a UFO. The UFO travelled horizontally, did a right angle turn and went up vertically and at the point of the turn pulled a corner of 30 G. Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about images allegedly coming back from the Opportunity rover, which experts say is a crinoid fossil? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about the structure of the quantum vacuum? Why doesn't Brian Cox talk about researchers such as Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, who have scientifically studied uh, phenomena such as psychic phenomena? Well, the reason is, is because Brian Cox's job is to keep the public's mind focused on a GCSE level science. That's it. And to fool people into thinking there's nothing worth knowing in science outside of that, when the reality is there's a vast amount that has been covered up. And just for your own entertainment, he is the man himself. Students from Highbury Primary School ask, when something enters a black hole, what happens next? <laughs> now that's a brilliant question. The, the quick answer is, we don't know. Now, dark matter. Lots of students have been asking the simple question, what is it? <laughs> Great question, <laughs> don't know. Noah from TAFE SA asks, is maths the language of the universe? <laughs> uh, yes. Why that is the case, uh, we, we don't know. Being baffled is a great position to be in, I think. Absolutely. And then you go and try and unbaffle yourself. That's, that's the definition of science, I would say. Amina from Tilopia Park asks, how is the human brain linked to the cosmos? What is it to be, to, to be me then, to be you? What is it to be alive and conscious? And the answer is, we, we, we don't know. Mandy from Darwin High School and Matthew from Gungahlin College ask, 
Will we ever be able to travel faster than the speed of light? Well, Mandy and Matthew, I think the answer is no. Now, the idea of life on other planets. Students from Highbury Primary School ask, is there life on other planets? Aliens, even? It's a, as I said at the start, it's one of the questions I really want to know, and I think we might answer very soon. Um, obviously, if there isn't any, we'll, we'll never answer the question. As I mentioned earlier, the, the life on Mars, we're looking for that very seriously. Why? Because we think there's a chance that it, certainly a chance that it did exist at some point in the past, because we know water flowed over the surface of Mars. But we also strongly suspect that there's water below the surface of Mars now. And so any microbes that, that evolved perhaps many billions of years ago could have survived subsurface. So we may find life on Mars. Um, so I think that's one of the, potentially one of the great discoveries that, it's a guess again, it's not a particularly scientific thing to say, the reason we build big spacecraft to go and land on Mars is because we want to look. So we don't know. If we knew, we wouldn't go and build a spacecraft to go and have a look. Otto from Carlingford High School asks, following the discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN, what's the next great big experiment for physics? Ah, well, well the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is will continue to be one of the next great experiments. The, the thing about the Higgs boson is, yes, we've discovered it, or we've discovered a Higgs boson, but now what we have to do is we have to understand it. We have to, we have to do experiments. We have to characterize it, understand how it works precisely, understand whether it's the only one. That there are theories of, um, of, of particle physics that suggest there, aren't, there isn't just one Higgs boson. There, there might be more than one. There might be five of them. They might have different properties. So which one is it? And the answer to that is, we're not sure. We don't know. <laughs> All right. Now, remember what he said there. He said, we might find microbes on Mars. So according to him, there's no life on Mars. Uh, and that links into something I'm going to talk about in part two. All right, looking at number two on our false heroes and role model survey is Russell Brand. This viewer says, trapping young folk who are angry and see no point in the system the way it is, his anti-establishment facade began, in my opinion, with the Andrew Sachs phone message nonsense, which was pushed hard in everyone's face to present him as the bad boy and the darling of the youth. His current foray into politics is quite unlike the guy who used to be on MTV, capable of nothing more than tormenting people high on drugs at festivals for a cheap laugh. To me, this about face screams coaching. So this rich planet viewer thinks that Russell Brand has been coached to become political. Not to mention his links with Katy Perry, who has question marks over who owns her mind. This viewer says, offers hope to truthers as he has a mainstream media voice for some reason, but his ideas are full of, con of confusion and contradiction. This viewer says, claims to be leading a revolt against capitalism, but dates a Rothschild and sells his book, is also filthy rich. Uh, I believe he is being used for controlled opposition to lead people astray. At number three on the false heroes list is David Beckham. This viewer says he is thicker than a whale omelette. <laughs> and it is a <laughs> totally manipulated figure. Uh, even as I type this, has said he will continue in his United Nations role. Uh, he has not the intellect to hold the conversation. At number four on the list would get my vote, uh, Stephen Fry. Here he is. Uh, this viewer says regularly pops up voicing his opinions on various matters, the implication being that he is so intelligent that he knows better than us what is correct and thus his opinions are to be noted and followed. Has a show where he tells us that only he knows the real answers. Soon people start to believe all of the crap that comes out of his mouth. This viewer says, was quick to condemn Putin regarding apparently anti-homosexual legislation but strangely keeps quiet about Qatar and other Middle East countries where being gay can actually get you flogged or even worse. This inconsistency shows he's actually part of the global agenda and not an opinionated private person. He's also wheeled out to add to the global warming, sorry, climate change believers. He's also part of the LB, LGBT mind control. That stands for lesbian, gay, uh, bisexual, transgender. If you are gay, you're supposed to want to throw in your lot with lesbians and also transgender people. Now, here's some pictures of Stephen Fry with his husband, Stephen Fry's husband. Uh, I put this picture up at Glasgow and somebody shouted out, Is that Brian Cox? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> we've made a good pair um, of subversives. Uh, but, um, 
Yeah, yeah. Can I share with you what goes through my mind when I look at those photographs? Dare I? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what goes through my mind is this. Um, is Stephen Fry being controlled today by things which may have occurred in his past? All right, at number five is Katie Price, uh, Jordan, whose only talent is having enhanced you-know-whats. Uh, number six, the royal family. Well, we could do a whole show on the royal family. Uh, the royal family are a massive global marketing ploy. At number seven, Stephen Hawking. He's disabled, don't you know? Uh, he seems to reinforce the idea that we are all matter. There is no spirituality. Jeremy Kyle at number eight. Hmm. Have you ever wondered why this man appears in the daytime bracket? It's about the time when people are feeling good about their day, and as soon as they watch that demented freak, it's feel-bad time. <laughs> I have witnessed a number of people who have bought into this brainwashing and social uh, conditioning format of TV, and they too have acted like that towards the subject when it comes up in a conversation. At number nine, Bob Geldof. The UK sent £20 million to help Ebola, which I think is all a scam. At number 10, David Cameron goes without saying, I think. I believe he is controlled and told what to say by others. At number 11, Russell Howard must be controlled and scripted by MI5 or whoever. My wife likes him, but even she can see that something's wrong. Um, this person says, spouts BBC and government propaganda all over the place. Something very sinister about this shit. Uh, I have often seen him rubbishing any ideas that aren't mainstream thinking, including recently Sheldrake's ideas about a pet's sixth sense. Now, Russell Howard, he does criticise mainstream media, in particular the Daily Mail, but he does it in a way that everything's ridiculous. The stories are just silly or stupid. He doesn't actually ask why they're written the way they are and whether there's an agenda behind those stories. So hence, he actually hides the motives of mainstream media, in my opinion. Um, number 12, Bono, <laughs> sat on a fortune of £600 million but begs the average person in this country to help Africa. Uh, at number 13, Simon Cowell, the flagship bearer of the fame before intellect generation. Simon Cowell is a symbol of everything wrong with our society. Three people actually voted for all MPs. Um, <laughs> And three people voted for Anton Deck, the seemingly innocent Anton Deck. Openly promote the degradation of game show contestants as a means of desensitizing and denormalizing public perceptions relating to the effects of mental and physical cruelty, abuse and borderline torture, all dressed up as family entertainment. And I don't think it's an accident that they've cho chosen two such innocent looking chaps to present torture and cruelty.